Welcome everybody to today's episode of the Great Birth Rebellion podcast. My name is Dr. Melanie Jackson at Melanie the Midwife. I'm a clinical and research midwife with my PhD. Our Great Birth Rebellion premium members also get access to podcast transcripts, additional resources, the Ask Mel a Question button, and an exclusive monthly Ask Me Anything episode. That said, let's get into it. Welcome everybody to today's episode of the Great Birth Rebellion podcast. As I was writing the last episode on cord clamping versus cord tying, I was immersed in some historical and older writings and I came across how the APGAR score was developed and how the research was done to determine its use. And I was really shaken. I'll tell you about the APGAR score shortly, but I just want to flag that the APGAR is so deeply rooted in midwifery and obstetric practice that I don't think I've ever heard anyone speak on its relevance or be critical about its use. For the most part, we've accepted APGAR scoring as an effective way of determining the well-being of a baby at 1, 5, and 10 minutes after birth. But I wanted to share some new thoughts on APGAR scoring since having a look at how it came about, and it's left me wondering if there is any truth in anything that I've ever been taught as a midwife by Western medicine. So here we go, guys. This is uncharted ground, and you might just hear the first critical look at APGAR scoring today here on the Great Birth Rebellion podcast. So today I'm sharing, firstly, what an APGAR score is, how it came to be part of midwifery, pediatric, and obstetric practice, and some really obvious problems with the research that was used to test the validity and develop the APGAR scoring in the first place. And I want to float some thoughts about APGAR scoring from the perspective of physiological birth. Strap yourselves in. Whoever thought that APGAR scoring could be exciting, here we go. So what is an APGAR score? Put simply, it's usually a visual check of the baby at one minute, five minutes, and 10 minutes after birth. Midwives are trained to mentally take an APGAR score, and sometimes we need to put our hands on the baby in order to get a proper APGAR score. But in a well baby, a lot of it can be done just using sight. And we give the baby a score and it indicates the well-being of the baby. If the baby gets a score of zero to six, that indicates that the baby hasn't transitioned well from the uterus to breathing air and might need some time or assistance. And a score of seven to 10 is considered normal. So APGAR scores were designed to help identify babies that required respiratory support or other resuscitative measures. So it's like a decision-making tool for the clinician. If the baby has a score of less than seven, that indicates that maybe some action is required. There are five parts to an APGAR score and each category is weighted differently. And so you can either get a zero, one, or two for one of the five categories. So the components are then added all together and the score is recorded with the combined score. So I'll tell you how it's calculated and what we check. We firstly check for breathing effort. So if the baby is not breathing, they get a score of zero. If the baby is breathing, but the breath rate is slow or irregular or weak or gasping, it's not fully established, it gets a one. And if the baby's crying vigorously and obviously pink and, you know, we assume that the breathing efforts have been effective and they get a score of two. The next thing we check is the baby's heart rate. In a well healthy baby that's crying and screaming and beautiful and pink, we can assume that the heart rate is above 100 and therefore they get a score of two. If the baby appears unwell, then we might make extra efforts to check the baby's heart rate with a stethoscope or some electrical equipment. Or you can also put your hand on the baby's chest and feel the beats and count its heart rate. But from that, or sometimes you can get a good heart rate by clasping the cord. But essentially, if the heart rate is above 100, they get a 2. If it's below 100, they get a 1. And if there's no heartbeat, they get a 0. The next is muscle tone. So an inactive baby that's loose and floppy gets a 0. A baby that has some tone inflection, some ability to move its arms and legs, gets a score of 1. And a baby that's moving normally with flexed muscle tone and that resists having its limbs extended gets a score of 2. The next thing we look at is a grimace response or reflex irritability in response to stimulation. And a baby that has no response gets a zero. 
A baby who is grimacing in response to stimulation gets a score of one, and a baby who cries, coughs, or sneezes on stimulation or obviously has good reflexes gets a score of two. And the last thing we check is the baby's color. So most babies will only get a one for this, and one is still considered normal, so a total APGAR score of nine is still considered a pretty full full marks for that baby. If the baby gets a 10, it means its whole body was entirely pink, including its hands and feet, because they've gotten a two for color. Babies normally get a one for color because it's pretty typical that their hands and feet will remain purple for some time, maybe up to 24 hours after the birth. And so for that, because they're not fully pink, they only get a one. If the baby is pale or blue, the score is zero. So that's what an APGAR score is. But how did it come to be that we integrated it into our clinical work as midwives and maternity care providers? It all started in 1953 with anaesthetist Virginia Apgar, who, aghast with the lack of a standardized tool to assess the health of a baby at birth and frustrated that decisions about resuscitation of a baby were left up to just individual clinicians to decide whether or not that baby was well and didn't need any assistance or whether that baby was unwell and needed some efforts to resuscitate it. So she sought to create a method of measuring the well-being of a baby at one minute, five minutes and 10 minutes after birth as a way of having some kind of universal understanding of which babies required resuscitation and which babies didn't. Prior to 1953, there was no standardization or medical way of assessing a newborn's condition at birth. So in 1953, Virginia Apgar published a paper to explain her proposal for a new method of evaluating a newborn at birth and explained that over seven months, 2,096 babies were born in the hospital in which she worked. And here's where the research gets juicy. They only used 84% of the babies who were born in this facility. So only 1,760 records were available for use for this research. These are the births at which Virginia could analyze the data because there was anesthetic records for these women and babies. The other 16% that were excluded from analysis were excluded because these babies were born during what she puts in inverted commas or speech marks natural childbirth and there was no anaesthetist present. Babies born by natural childbirth were excluded from this research project and this is what Virginia comments in her paper. This is a quote. The missing 16% are chiefly those with pudendal blocks or natural childbirth patients. The omission of these cases is regrettable for they form the best control group for any study on infants resuscitation. In case you haven't picked up on the importance of this yet, The development of APGAR scoring was based on the work of an anaesthetist whose involvement with birth was from a surgical perspective and who was only involved in surgical or instrumental births and in those requiring the woman to be anaesthetized. She was not a witness to natural childbirth and in the development of the APGAR scoring tool, she knowingly excluded babies born through natural childbirth and only included babies who were born through interventions that were so dramatic that required an anaesthetist to be present. What's more is that in her analysis of the data, she grouped babies that were born by low forcep birth, and that was 34% of babies in her hospital were born by low forceps. She grouped them in with the spontaneous births that she also witnessed as her time as an anaesthetist that were attended by obstetricians. And she stated that when she observed babies born by low forceps and vaginal births, that they seemed to have the same outcome. So she felt confident to group those together in one single analysis group. And then she also studied babies that were born by cesarean, mid forceps, breech and twin births, but did not include babies who were born without intervention in natural childbirth. So already we can see that this scoring system at its very development and initiation, was being used to assess the well-being of a baby born as a result of medical intervention and knowingly excluded data that by her own admission 
would have created a control group for the baseline measurement of a baby's well-being at birth. So by this very method, Virginia Apgar has presented us with a tool that was only invented to assess the well-being of a baby born after a high intervention birth. She never sought to nor delivered a tool that was tested to assess the well-being of a baby born without intervention. So if you aren't already as crestfallen as I am when I read this, there's another clincher. And this is that when Virginia Apgar describes the method by which an Apgar is obtained in her study, and we learned this later, she wrote a second research paper in 1958. In that paper, she explains that by 60 seconds, it's expected that the Apgar score is taken, but that the umbilical cord is already cut and that the baby is in the hands of somebody other than the obstetrician, meaning another clinician. It's not in the hands of the mother. So here we have an assessment tool based on babies that are born born at the hands of an obstetrician with the presence of an anaesthetist, along with varying scales of intervention and and a baby whose cord was cut before 60 seconds after birth, which we have always known is not enough time for the baby to receive their full blood volume back from the placenta. So let's be clear that from its very first development, the APGAR score is a tool that's designed to be applied to compromised babies and babies who've experienced high intervention births. So I'm proposing that the APGAR score is not a valid tool to be applied to babies who are born without intervention and who are receiving the benefits of optimal cord clamping when their cord is left intact for longer than 60 seconds. This also doesn't apply to babies born under the care of a midwife because midwifery care and obstetric care is very, very different. I don't have an alternative solution to offer you here about the most appropriate way to assess a baby at birth. I'm just saying that an APGAR score doesn't, by the scientific method and any standards that we expect today, it doesn't stand up as a valid tool. It doesn't have generalizability. It can only be applied under the circumstances under which it was tested. And that is with an obstetrician, with a woman who's been anesthetized in some way, with a baby who's had their cord cut earlier than 60 seconds after birth. So if someone is listening to this who has access to a research facility or wants to pursue higher research in the form of an honors or master's or PhD, I'd be suggesting that there's a huge amount of space for some research on the development of an assessment tool for babies who are born in the presence of a midwife without intervention and whose cord has not been prematurely cut. An assessment tool that applies to physiological birth. And I'm talking about the development of a tool that applies to physiological birth because the APGAR score, as it stands, can only be applied to medicalized births in the presence of intervention rapid cord clamping and at the hands of an obstetrician. That's this week's episode of the Great Birth Rebellion. And if you learned something new today, you can get more by following me, Melanie the Midwife and the Great Birth Rebellion on social media and by subscribing to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for being here for today's episode of the Great Birth Rebellion podcast. If you want to get access to all the resources that we use to create every single podcast episode, you can join the mailing list at melaniethemidwife.com or better still, the premium members hub. The premium members get access to transcripts, the Ask Mel a Question button, an exclusive Ask Me Anything episode every month. All the details are in the show notes and I will see you in the next episode of The Great Birth Rebellion.